again, we have seen a lot and we have taught in a number of situations now for, oh, close to 30 years or 30 years or more, I guess. Um, and so there are a number of different things to consider. The first part we'll look at is materials and pedagogy. And again, this depends very strongly on what class you have. So for example, my graduate school is called Institute of Linguistics, and in my course, courses, step one, usually I need to find a good textbook. That's really crucial. Find a good textbook and then divide all my assignments into stages so that I can conquer, uh, divide and conquer. So in this process, because in graduate school, students need to write term papers, both my TA and I are working together at each stage to look at their structure, their English, you know, depending on how many students I have. Usually, you know, we have 10, but sometimes 20, 20 students. But if you divide and conquer, that's a lot of work. But as an EMI instructor, that's necessary because they need to learn to write in proper English in the right genre too. So these are my, uh, you know, different uh, stages. For my undergraduate, I also need to uh, inculcate some kind of collaborative learning mentality. So I like to use case studies. Uh, so, uh, you know, case studies, for example, uh, we can talk about why, oh, why Peking Mayor Ke Wenzhe has become a politician from a medical doctor. Then we look at uh, what happened many years ago when uh, he directed uh, organ transplant, which was a uh, um, AIDS infected organ. That's why he was sick and tired of, uh, you know, all this legislative yuan uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, to, to question him. So he became a politician. All right. <laughs> So that's a case study, and we use uh, interesting uh, topics for role play, group discussion, reflection, and final group presentation. Again, my TA, usually more than one, because I use other sources to get grants to support my TAs. Yeah, not just one TA. You don't put your eggs in one basket. <laughs> You need more different people to address different needs. So it pays, it pays to get more TAs if you can get grant to pay for TAs. And then in, in the, uh, again, in the engineering graduate program, my situation is a little different. I teach them the, the structure of research articles. Uh, but then along with that, skills in reading the research articles skills in using the word program. Because most people can type, but they don't know a lot about making tables, formatting, many of the other higher functions. EndNote, a reference manager, is extremely useful for, for graduate students. Um, and most of them are not familiar with that. And then uh, sometimes even helping them clarify their research goal, because that's part of the course, is to write about their research topic. If they're first semester graduate students, I need to learn to help them, even though I'm not an engineer, I have to learn to help them to clarify their research goal. Okay. One of the other things that we both focus on is blended learning. What is blended learning? Blended learning means you don't use just one strategy. You don't just lecture. You don't always do it the same way. You have a blend of online resources, textbook, class, discussion, various different ways of learning so that something uh, for everybody. But again, 
If you add something, you have to take something away. There's a limited volume in your class. You can't just keep adding, adding, adding. You have to have a balance. And so for local students, EMI, they learn English as well as content. For international students, EMI is the only choice in many cases because their Chinese is not good enough to follow in, in Chinese. But by using a mixture of oral, visual, such as PowerPoints, illustrations, videos, it helps them to understand uh, no matter what their learning style, no matter what their background. Another thing that we do every week, both of us, is provide a chance for immediate feedback. Uh, we have an e-course system, which is an online uh, system for, for the course, and we have a chance for them to provide feedback on that system every week. Just to say, what did you learn? What did you like? What did you dislike? Do you have any suggestions? Any questions? So that immediately we know, particularly in the first few weeks of the course, if you address their felt needs in the first few weeks of the course, and you say, I'm paying attention to your needs, then they're with you. Let me tell you the secret why I use immediate feedback so well that I have won Best Teachers Awards many times. Every class, before the class is over, I save five minutes for the students to answer four questions. What do you like about today's class? What don't you like? What have you learned? What questions do you have? So basically, likes, dislikes, what have you learned, and what questions do you have? In five minutes, they wrote down everything. Then, as soon as I collect them, I start to do another PPT, addressing all their questions. The next class, next time when we meet again, I spend the first five minutes addressing all those questions. If it's urgent, I immediately write an email to the student to answer his or her question. So when I do that, my students feel, oh, my teacher is caring, cares about me. You know, my needs, my struggles, my problems. You know, she understands me and she cares about me. That's important. So all the problems can be solved before they become too big. That's the trick. <laughs> and it has served me very well. So I hope you can also use this. I learned this from somebody else in a teaching workshop. Yeah, and that has served me very well. Five minutes, it will save you <laughs> a lot of troubles. And it will get you Best Teachers Award. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's not all student-directed, right? <laughs> okay, so what does blended learning include? Um, it includes a textbook. If it's an EMI course, it should be in English, because that's where they will learn the vocabulary. And they can read it ahead, they can check the vocabulary, and then when you talk about it in class, they are already prepared. Uh, you may include MOOCs online videos, other online materials, PowerPoints, uh, PDFs, software, classroom activities, assignments, all of these are part of the learning experience. And in my class, I always like flipped classroom. Even though last night at our dinner time, we say flipped classroom, that's a passe. No, past tense. We don't hear about this kind of word. You're wrong. It's still there, even though we don't talk about it. We just take it for granted. Flipped classroom. So my students always have to read the assigned chapters before they come. And sometimes I use Kahoot to check if they have already grasped some of the ideas. 
So if you tell them you need to do that, you need to have a mechanism to check if they have done their homework. And if they haven't, they feel, oh, I'm ashamed. How can I possibly, you know, I'm prepared to this class. So I uh, took time making all kinds of moves to strengthen, to give supplemental materials for my courses. Okay. And in my case, again, similarly, uh, as I mentioned, I also use a flipped classroom. I wrote a textbook because it was, there wasn't a suitable one available. But with that textbook, I made PowerPoint summaries of each chapter. So if they don't want to read the whole chapter or it's just too much, they can watch a 10 to 15 minute summary of the main points of that chapter. And also made a MOOC for the first uh, nine lessons that talk about the structure of research articles. And after so many years of learning to teach, I decided to write a research article to summarize my framework. In other words, in an EMI class, first of all, we need to look at our language use. I remember our professor in mathematics said, you know, where does my confidence come from? Our confidence comes from our expertise, in your case, using English to explain math. That's your expertise. So, what's the standard way of speaking English, using English in your expertise, in your field? That's what the students need to learn. And then, when we are discussing with one another or giving lectures, we need to be concerned about people from different backgrounds. So some people tend to speak very fast, like that. But especially Indian speakers, Indian speakers, yes. they speak yes. very fast. Yes. Yeah, OK, but they need to slow down. Yeah. So that's the variation. And finally, the community. Why do the students need to learn in our classroom? Because they are novice. They are novice. They are learning to go into the community to become a core member of this community from peripheral position all the way, you know, learning to become the core members. So they can talk like a mathematician. They can talk like an engineer in English. And then the second part is in our teaching pedagogy. We always need to take into consideration three things. The content accompanied with different pedagogy. That will become different, okay? And then in collaboration with technology, all three together, then this looks very different from simply you know, delivering content in a lecturing style. So that's the second part, all three together. And then we always need to look at the standards. What's the goal in this class? What the students need to achieve as a mathematician, as a linguist, as an engineer, as a biologist? What do they need to achieve? What's the standards? And what tasks do I need to design so they can learn to achieve the goal? And how do I assess their achievement? How do, we, how do I know they've already learned this? So I have constant evaluation using Kahoot, using online testing quizzes, this and that, you know, or just verbal checking. Okay. Constant, constant checking. Okay, so we mentioned this idea of a flipped classroom a couple times. In a typical classroom, the new material is presented in class, and then they go home and they work. But the flipped classroom is the reverse. And the benefit of that, again, particularly for a writing class, uh, but for any class, if they start going the wrong way and you're in class, you can redirect rather than they go home, they think they've got it, they go there, they reach that point, and then you say, oh, no, you should be way over here and they have to redo it, you have to redo it, 
So by catching that, those problems earlier, by having them working in class, you can redirect at an early stage, and it, it's much more effective. That means that they need to read before class and, and come prepared. And that also means, in many cases, that they will need to bring some sort of electronic device to class to, to work on. We mentioned the textbook. Uh, it needs to be in English. It needs to be at the right level, so it's comprehensible. Um, and you need to think, does the textbook do a good job of introducing the terms or do you need to introduce them even before they read the textbook? You need to think about that. How much should they read? Again, that depends on the level of the class, the level of the students, uh, and their, their needs and interests. And we also need to learn to keep up with the technology. Here is a textbook I collaborated with my professor as a PhD student in 1991. Um, Filipino through self-instruction. It's all paperwork, paper. But now, 20 years later, <laughs> 30 years later. 30, <laughs> Now, I uh, did a MOOC using, reusing some of the ideas in the textbook into a current, you know, technology uh, enhanced uh, style. So being an EMI instructor doesn't mean you just teach that class. You may need to think about what other things can I create, like a MOOC, like PowerPoints, like whatever, to help the students learn. And that's extra work for me outside of class but it makes it easier when you get into class and therefore gives better results. Again, many science textbooks talk about IMRD. I use that same idea to describe engineering articles using a similar uh, idea uh, in, so that it's, a, it's still familiar territory um, and easier for the students to understand. In the textbook, I specifically put in a number of things to help students read it. Call-out boxes to, to highlight the main things. Evaluate your understanding to point out the main points at the end of each chapter. And I show these to the students at the beginning of the semester. I say, open your textbook, look at this. This is how you can read more effectively. Okay? Again. Preferably choose a textbook that is well written, easy for students to understand, with these sort of assists, but help your students to read it. Don't just say read the textbook. Show them how to read the textbook effectively. And for me, I like to make filming MOOCs, and I also invite my graduate students to film MOOCs together. And as I know, my weakness, I'm not good at digital technology, but I, as a linguist, I need to do something on the content side, but I can recruit graduate students who are digital natives, <laughs> digital natives, to learn to use digital technology to help me. So I asked my five graduate students, each took a story and to make a virtual reality story, a VR story, VR game. So they not only learned Filipino structure, they also took each story and make, based on the text, short text, to develop a uh, VR story. And as they've been trained in, I ask them to train my students in my undergraduate and my graduate courses to use VR code spaces. And, uh, you know, I am uh, very active. I like to try new things. So, energizer. Energizer. 
appetizer. Yes, I hate boredom. I don't want to be bored. I want to try new things to learn, to teach, to learn a foreign language. So I asked an engineer, uh, a PhD student at CCU from Indonesia, to develop a chat bot so my students can learn to use that program to develop their own chat bot. They can, uh, so I put it into uh, uh, practice into my Indonesian undergraduate classes and to my applied linguistics courses. Okay, and again, as I mentioned, for academic writing, I not only teach the structure of articles, but there are a lot of word functions, Microsoft Word, that are very useful that a lot of students don't learn they just know how to type. And, and so I incorporate that into the class. And I then require that in the assignments. I teach them how to put headings into the articles so that they can use the navigation pane to move around the article. And then I require them to do that as part of their assignment, as part of uh, the, the, the class requirements. Um, they do oral presentations, three oral presentations during the course of a semester. Um, and again, I teach them the first time it's sort of show me what you got. The second time I teach them how to make a better PowerPoint. And by the third time, they have learned a lot of those more advanced techniques of doing an oral presentation. I teach them endo and, and the how much faster it is and, and more efficient uh, to use a reference manager uh, for, your, for your references. And these are just gradually built in along with the basic content throughout the course of the semester. So this again, this is my version of technology. It's very simple, basic technology, but extremely practical, extremely useful, and a lot of the comments at, at the end of the semester are, this was really, really useful. And because it's intended to be practical. Uh, as, I, as we've mentioned before, both of us use this idea of temperaments at the beginning of class uh, to help get students talking to one another from the very first day, to help us understand them. Uh, <laughs> I also have people working in pairs, doing a peer review. And in order to get people in groups, I use activities like everybody gets a star. And initially they say, I've got a star, I've got a star too. I've got a gray star, I've got a gray star too. Mine has <laughs> eyes, so does mine. And they have to learn to describe very carefully. Because in engineering, they have to learn to describe this is where we started, this is how we changed it. The details are important. And so they are practicing, even when they're, I don't just say, okay, you know, pair randomly. They are learning even in the course of doing this pairing for, for small groups for peer review. Um, and then again, my lecture is very limited because they've already read. They've already seen the material. And so I can go through the, those parts very quickly, but they have student presentations each week. Um, they'll present their work. One student or two students will present their work and show the class how to do the assignment for that week. They do it ahead, they try. And then that provides a model for the other students of what they are going to do in class. Uh, the discussion, the think, pair, share, uh, many different activities that they have developed for my particular situation so that they are active participants. And then innovative assessments. Again, these are the questions uh, that we use for the weekly feedback. Both of us use uh, similar sets of questions to get uh, responses from students very quickly and to catch problems 
early before they become big. Formative assessment is also important. Formative assessment is, is as you're going along, you check, 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 do they have it? Rather than just midterm, final, the end. You make sure that they are learning, practicing, going along. It's the difference between the chef testing the noodles and serving it. Okay? So you don't just serve it to the guests without checking to make sure that, that it's good first. Okay, and so that means that this formative assessment is a scaffolding that you write in stages. You write, rewrite, with fixed goals for every stage. For my class, they turn something in usually every two weeks. They write, they go home, they, they, they rewrite, they come back, they discuss it in class, write, rewrite again, and then turn it in every two weeks. So every time there's a chance for me to comment, they revise, it's just this continual process of making it better and better um, with clear rubrics at, at, at every stage um, so that they achieve the purpose. First half of the semester, they look at the structure of research articles and they describe them the overall structure, the structure of each division, where the graphics and citations are. Write, rewrite, write, rewrite, write, rewrite. By the final description, they've already done it all in stages. Um, and, and so it's just a matter of putting it all together. Same thing with writing their own research article introduction. Write, rewrite, write, rewrite. So by the end of the semester, uh, it's, it's completed. It's not, we're learning, 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 learning. The last two weeks, write your own paper. That's how it's done in some classes. That doesn't work. But if they're doing it and checking it, yes, it's a lot of work for you. But it helps the students and it accomplishes the Tell course. us the secret. How did you manage to correct students' papers? But you can hire so many right, me, right, right, me, right. Uh, well, for me, I had to limit my number of students. I mean, initially, I started in the first class with 20 students, and it was too much for one class because I want to be able to go around and talk to each student for about five minutes or so at least within each class. And that means if you have 20 students, 20 times five, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> you can't do it in any reasonable length of time. Uh, so I had to limit my number of students so that I could accomplish the goals of the class. And uh, you know, most semesters, I'll get one or two students that say, I really, really want to take this course. Can you add me? No. <laughs> and, and I mean, you know, they, the first class, 15 students will show up. I say, if you're interested, come. Because a lot of students will drop and you may get in. And usually, by the end, it winds up being about the, the, right, the right number. But um, if it's more than that, I say, try next semester. Because really, here's why. I have made a commitment that I will talk with each student individually for a certain amount of time, and that means I must limit it. Otherwise, I cannot do my job. Even my though you have uh, 10 students in your class, at each stage, do you have different strategies when you correct their English? Oh, of course. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, so here in the, in the second part, you can see they go through three stages of revision. And at the first stage, I only look at the overall organization. I look at the, the paragraph structure, the paragraph order. Then I look at, in the second stage, um, the, the, the clarity. You know, 
is are there connectors between one paragraph and another? Uh, then finally the, the English and the, the format. So at each stage, each time, I don't correct all of their English. I don't correct all of the mistakes. If it's a repeated mistake, I'll say, hey, you need to pay attention. You always leave a space inside the parenthesis, which is improper in English, even though it looks like a Chinese parenthesis. Um, so I'll point these things out, but I won't make all of those corrections. Um, but yes, by stages, by stages. Okay, let's move on. So again, the purpose of this is you're trying to encourage higher order thinking skills. If you just do multiple choice testing, you're testing the very, very lowest level of thinking. But writing applies higher and higher and higher levels of, of thinking skills, and therefore is more beneficial to the students long term. In terms of learning, active learning works. This has been shown by numerous studies. The more involved students are going from listening to a lecture, they only remember 5%, all the way down to, to writing, practicing, teaching others. Teaching others involves peer review. Okay? And you can, again, our goal is that the students learn. Not that we teach, but that they learn. And that means they have to be involved. Like I said, why do we need to be an EMI instructor? It's because of our expertise in our field. We know how English is used in all skills in English in our field. And remember, students as a novice, they don't know all those terms we use technically in our field. So we need to pay attention to the terminology and give clear examples again and again so they understand the concept. Once again, oral communication is not the only channel, even though you know some professors in their regular traditional teaching, they prefer lecturing style. But remember, in EMI, they need more than just oral, verbal communication. They need other materials, videos, PPT, and other things to supplement the work. And they also, students need to read the materials before they come. And in order to know whether your students get it or not, we need to do immediate feedback before the problem goes too large. So again, as, as we've mentioned, uh, there are a lot of different strategies uh, using good teaching materials, flipped classroom, interaction, scaffolding, multiple assessments, formative and summative. Uh, all of these are, are strategies that will be helpful. And these are, again, good teaching strategies, no matter whether you're teaching in EMI or, or whatever. I think I will finish here because the rest I can only summarize in one sentence. Why don't people understand my class? Because they because I talk too much or beyond their level. And how do I encourage people to discuss? I need to have a limited task manageable. Not just talk about A, B, C, D, all kinds of things, but we have a fixed goal. And the rest, I don't think I need to go into the teaching and the uh, speaking activities. Yeah, we have, we have some, some specific notes uh, there on some of the things. Uh, Victoria has taught listening and speaking, um, and I teach writing, reading, and writing. And so we have a lot more material than we could possibly cover. <laughs> um, feel so we free need to, to reduce. Yeah. Reduce. We, we already reduced this quite a bit, but 
<laughs> um, feel free to look through that. We will be here the rest of the day. If you want to talk at, at lunch or during any of the breaks or whatever, we'd be glad to, to talk with you further uh, about that. But let's just take, uh, again, a, a minute or two to uh, talk with one another, see if you have any questions, uh, and then we'll take one final set of questions before we conclude our session. So my question is quite simple. Is that I know I read something if we can ask students to read uh, in advance. So uh, do you know is that we can always ask them to read? But how if you any tips to check students or encourage them to really read the materials? Because you know sometimes we just jump into the class and there's some students think like they are not going to respond then uh, how? Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically, how do we get students to read and how do we check? Mm -hmm. Quiz. If, if, quiz, <laughs> yes. But if, if, that's terrible. <laughs> students will hate you. <laughs> A much better way, from my perspective, is if you expect it, if you expect them to know the material, in order to be able to do the work, in class, they have to have read, then they learn it's beneficial to do so. Otherwise, like, I don't know what to do. Well, did you read? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have okay. two strategies. Number one, when the class began, I would ask, who has read the materials? Then, sometimes you would have one student or several raise their hands. They say, if I just read a little bit the step down, I say, yes, as long as you open the book, you know, read something that counts. Then you see some, you know, some people raise their hands. Then I said, who would like to share just one point they remember from the textbook? And maybe one student will say this. Say, what else do you remember? Another say, one point. Can't be more than one point. <laughs> okay, I found that's helpful. And in, in the next time, who has read the materials? You can see a few more hands. <laughs> and then, again, just ask people. That's my first strategy. Yeah. Again, it's something that you have to build in. Because they're not used to it. You have to teach them. In this class, it makes a difference. I don't care about your other classes. They may say read and you know it doesn't matter. In this class it makes a difference. You have to build that into your class. My second strategy is for graduate students. The first one is for undergrad, which is more friendly. <laughs> the second strategy is I assign you to give a eight minute presentation of this chapter. Yeah, sometimes students tend to have 20 minutes, no way, eight minutes, no more, no less. Give me a good presentation. I also check their presentation ahead of time to see everything is correct and uh, manageable. So that's the second strategy, which works. So you can see whatever they misunderstand, you know, in their PPT. So that's the second strategy. That's also built in your assessment. Yeah, and likewise, I, I have the student presentations. It means they at least read two or three times a semester because they have to do the presentation. But if they begin to learn to do that, and again, if you choose a good textbook and you teach them how to read it, so it's not just like, Ugh, English, but you teach them how to read it then that can help as well. Especially when students read an English textbook, it will take six years for them to keep reading those materials in order to have no new vocabulary. <laughs> Otherwise, they will keep checking the new words, still don't understand the whole structure. Because I struggle with that. It takes me six years in graduate school to be able to read the journal articles without any new vocabulary. So it is a big challenge for students to read in English. That's why you need to check 
what have you read? And then help them focus without being overwhelmed by so much material. But just use eight minutes. Give me the main points.